Okay, so the world birds example that I showed you is something I've been working on for about three years. The Brazilian plants example that I showed you was developed pretty much start to finish in the course of three or four months in Brazil last year. I'd like to kind of keep shortening the amount of time just so these things become, you know, kind of, so they're not so daunting that you don't even start. So I wanted to take one of the data sets um, that I circulated to you all and develop it as kind of an example so that it would be just a little bit more tangible. So I decided to avoid South Africa just because there was too much information. And in fact, it turns out there might have been an error in that, in that um, file. So if you're trying to unpack it, we haven't been able to even with the original that they sent me from GBIF. So I wrote Sami Gaiji and asked him to re-export it and resend it. And we'll see if he's traveling or in the office. I think if he's in the office, he'll get it to me pretty quickly. Um, so I kind of went down the list and like the next, the next biggest file was for Kenya. And I figured, okay, that's a, that's a country where there should be uh, decent data density. And uh, again, all I wanted was an example. And I wanted it to be an example that would be pretty much accessible for you guys. So um, developing this example took me one afternoon, kind of one to five, so four hours of work. Um, I tell you that only so that it seems like something that you can do. It is something that you can do. Um, basically, I'm going to show you this example. And then to start off the afternoon, we're just going to talk just a bit about um, what things you can do and what the, the workflow would be. And then just get you guys rolling on exploring the data set for your country and your taxon, okay? Um, and so that'll be much more hands-on, and I will certainly roam the room. Um, probably Kate can help out with, with some troubleshooting with, with the data as well. Um, but essentially, we'll, we'll set out some, some objectives. Some of them will be really easy, and some of them will be a little harder and some of them will require some GIS ability. So hopefully what we'll have is somebody in the room work out kind of each of the challenges that I'm going to toss onto the, onto the table for you, okay? We'll talk about that after lunch. For right now, I want to give you this, this Kenya example, again, just as a way of kind of making this a little bit more tangible for you. Um, so you saw those, those files that were extracted from the GBIF data portal. Um, essentially, this is thanks to Sami Gaiji. If you ever meet him, he's, he's one of the um, kind of science officers at GBIF. If you ever meet him, please say thank you to him mm -hmm. because he very generously contacted me and said, hey, would this be of any use to you? And I said, yes. Okay, I knew you guys would like it. Um, but he wrote some scripts that basically jump into the GBIF index and pull out uh, sets of data and do a set of, of cleaning steps. And I'll admit, I haven't taken the time to look at exactly what those steps were. But Sammy basically felt that this was an okay extract from GBIF. Okay, so for Kenya, uh, that data set consists of 234,000 records overall. But that might be like, you know, some lichens and some birds and some fossils or whatever. So I certainly want to filter this down to a single taxon. And given my own biases, it was pretty obvious that that was going to be birds. Um, 107,000 of the 234,000 records were bird records. So, the next step 
in the Darwin core. So this is the standard data format that GBIF data are served in and that any um, published data set is generally served in now. Uh, Darwin core has some quality flags. And so I think there's a you know, taxonomy problem, yes, no. And there's a geography problem, yes, no. And there's any other problem, yes, no. And so I filtered out all the records that have problem flags. And you can see I lost like 350 records. I don't care. Okay, who knows what those problems were. Again, I did this in one afternoon. So there are going to be several points at which I say, I didn't look at that because I just didn't have time. Okay. So the idea then, using that flagging system in Darwin Core, the idea is that I now have 106,000 records of birds in Kenya that I can use for an analysis. That's kind of cool. That's a lot of data. So let's start by cleaning up our data. That's always the bad news. So I started kind of looking at the data set. And the first thing I find is 1,516 unique Latin binomials in the data set. And that felt like a pretty high number. That's more on the level of Colombia or Venezuela. But Kenya shouldn't be that high. And in fact, it isn't that high. Um, so I was expecting the usual sort of taxonomic name garbage. So there are going to be gender errors like, you know, gymnorhinus versus gymnorhina. And there's going to be some typos. There's going to be some old generic names in there such that a few hundred species might be represented twice in the data set under this name and under that name, but they are synonyms, right? And I'm very, very, very used to that from this World Birds Project. So I'm, I'm thinking, okay, that number is going to come down quite a bit. And I want to see kind of where the garbage is. So I start exploring. Years and years ago, with one of my students, we took the four or five major global bird authority lists, so essentially lists of birds of the world, and we concatenated them. We lined them up, and species by species, genus by genus, family by family, we mapped all of the names in this list to all of the names in this list. And sometimes one list recognizes two species where the other list lumps them. So then you would have, you know, essentially lines like this. This name refers to two in this, in this data set. That took us a couple of years, um, not full time. But essentially we had the Sibley and Monroe list, which was mid-1980s. We had the Moroni, Bach, and Farron list, which was mid-1970s. We had the Peters list, which was 1920 to 1970s. It took 50 years to finish. And then we had a list from Clements, which was quite new. So I lined up the, I know it says three, and there are four here. I can count, OK? Um, I lined up those 1,516 species in the GBIF data set against each of these authority lists. And I got exactly the same result that I got in the World Birds Project, that the best match was with Sibley and Monroe. And the reason is, this Peters taxonomy is old. I mean, it was, it was old when I was young, and now I'm not so young, and so it's even older. Um, some of those volumes haven't been updated in 50 or 60 years. So the generic concepts are rather odd. And it's, it's just, this is not going to be a close match. And Moroni, Bach, and Ferrand was an effort to take the Peters taxonomy, which remember had spanned 50 years. And Moroni, Bach, and Ferrand just basically updated the old parts and brought it up to kind of 1975 or something like that standards. Clements was very new 
and so it would have newer names than some of these Kenyan data. And Sibley and Monroe is kind of right in the middle. So that, I think that's why Sibley and Monroe ends up being the best match. It's certainly not the best taxonomy. Um, but it's, it's the closest match to this mishmash of data that we get when we probe into GBIF. Some of it's a century old, some of it's brand new, and so you're kind of finding something in the middle. But that covered 85% of the species in my list of 1,500. So that's a pretty good match. And again, I wasn't doing this for publication. If I was doing it for publication, I'd track down those last 15% and I'd fix them. So I'm going to use Sibley and Monroe as kind of a best balance. And I'm going to discard that 15% of, of data that have a species name that's not on my best authority list. Okay? So now, again, I was, I'm worried. Why, why do I have, I mean, what's 85% of 1,516? It's still a lot of species. So I went on the web and I found a checklist for Kenya. And guess what? 1,100 species are known from the country, not 1,500. And I, even, I wouldn't even expect that all of the species known from the country would be in the GBIF uh, mediated data set. So something's really wrong here. And in fact, something was really wrong that I didn't expect. There's 1,106 species, but we had 1,295 matches between the GBIF data and the Sibley and Monroe list. So I've got a couple hundred or more extra species in there. Again, something's wrong here. So I start doing some comparisons. Only 729 were in common. Okay? 566 were on the, in the GBIF data set, but not known from Kenya. And again, I'm thinking these are going to be misspellings. But I start looking at them. Adolfo, when was the last time you heard about Alania albiceps being outside of the New World? Okay, it's a flycatcher. It's a family that's never been found in Africa. It's just plain an error. So if I had more time, I'd be looking that, at that list of species, those 566 names. How do a whole bunch of New World taxa end up with the country name Kenya. I have no idea. Okay? But I, I'm showing you this just because I want you to appreciate the amount of cleaning. Otherwise, it's garbage in, garbage out. I showed you a minute ago, an hour ago, how good taxonomy versus bad taxonomy makes a huge difference as far as the quality of those completeness values that we calculate, right? So, um, this in and of itself is really damning. There's some source of problem. It'll be interesting if some of you guys do that exercise. It'll be very interesting to see uh, what you find for other countries. And then, quite expected is that 300 species, 377 species that are known from Kenya weren't represented amongst the GBIF mediated digital accessible knowledge. Some old specimen in the, in the British Museum not represented amongst the digital data. Okay, that doesn't surprise me at all. This scares me. So somehow some garbage got in there. And I haven't tracked down where the garbage came from. But I'm just going to take, sorry, those 729 species that were in the GBIF data set and that were known from Kenya. And so then I start looking at family level representation. I just want to see, are there gaps taxonomically, which might ma map onto ecology or sampling or something. But are there gaps taxonomically? So this is, of the species known to occur in Kenya, what proportion of them are represented in the GBIF data set? And so for all of these families, it's 100% representation. 
For these families, it's pretty decent representation. For these families, it's getting worse. And for these families, it's zero. Okay? So I kind of want to do something about this. I eyeball those families, and they're all aquatic bird families. So the easy solution is, and Adolfo and I have done this for years and years and years, is look at the terrestrial birds and not the aquatic birds. And so this picture, which has a fair amount of poorly known stuff in it, turns into this picture, uh, where at least each of the families is at least partially represented in the data set. Okay? So now I've, in some sense, cleaned up the, the taxonomic information. In this case, because I was in a hurry, I just threw out the stuff that was inconvenient. Okay? And I reduced the taxa. So I'm down from 730 species, I'm down to 630 species, which are the land bird, the terrestrial birds in Kenya. So after this, these quality control measures, I go from 106,000, oops, down to 65,000 records. So I had been hoping when I saw all those non-standard names, I had been hoping that it would be one or two records referring to each one. But rather, it was 40,000 records that I lost. Okay? Bad. So now I'm basically starting to think, okay, now I've got some clean data that I can use for analysis. So first of all, let's start looking at it by year. And we see pretty much what we expect. Before 1880, there's not much. Just a few very old specimens that probably are sitting in European museums, probably type specimens that got digitized, but basically nothing. And in fact, that 1800 might even be somebody's way of saying somewhere in the 1800s, I don't know when. That's another big problem that we have. Um, and then once we start getting some sampling, look at that, we can see the Great Depression and the World War. Um, but we start getting up to some good numbers in more modern data. Probably it's all observational. Okay. If we look at it seasonally, all I did was I extracted the months and the frequency of months in, um, in the whole data set after cleaning. And what you see is that amongst samplers, the most popular season is July. But we've got several thousand records kind of for every month. So we don't have big, big gaps. Sometimes you see you know, a big gap in the season when the migrants are there or in the breeding season and you start worrying, well, wow, maybe, maybe there are going to be really big gaps in our lists that come out of this. So I don't see huge problems here. So now we get the geographic coverage. And obviously for geographic coverage, I need latitude-longitude information. So we have 65,000 records that we think are fit for use. Of those, 27,000 have latitude-longitude data attached to them. Okay? So remember, I started with 107,000 records that I thought I could use. And I'm down to less than a third of that. Okay? So if I look at those across Kenya, I see a lot of the things that I expect. Nairobi, the national parks, uh, the beaches, and nothing close to Somalia, right? Kind of what I'm expecting. Um, but I want to start to generalize this, because remember, this point might be 10,000 records, or it might be one record. So I want to I do something more than just look at the points. So what I did was I created a grid fairly coarse, and I started totaling up numbers of records from each of those grid squares. And then I took um, an inverse distance weighting surface fitting, 
and just kind of fit a surface to summarize the general trends. So there you can see the, the, the records on top of the surface, and there you can see the surface. But basically what we're saying, especially once I start putting in the numbers of records, the only sectors of Kenya where there are bird data is essentially the southwestern third of the country. The entire north and the entire east is basically undocumented with current digital accessible knowledge. That's always the caveat. I know there are data out there. But what I'm saying is if it's not digital and not accessible, it doesn't exist. That's the modern world. So how does, any questions so far? So any of you with some GIS ability should be able to get this far with your data sets uh, that we gave you from your countries. Any questions up to this point? Guys are going to have lots of questions when you're trying to process your data. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on a second. Sorry. It's a... So, do you know in Jiba they get that um, precision in the coordinates? How, how reliable are those? Because, you know, I, I mean, I haven't even found what units... Yeah, there. yeah. GBIF has been very reluctant about giving the ancillary data about um, georeferences. They basically have never jumped into this. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Um, if you want the really nice version of much of the same data, go to the VertNet portal. So VertNet, after that NABIN effort I told you about, we started sending big proposals to the National Science Foundation. So first there was a mammal network, and then herps, and then fishes. Birds had been kind of the initial example, so we came in fourth for the big one. But in each case, what was proposed was a network of 30, 40, 50 uh, major natural history museums across the U.S. <coughs> and beginning with the manus, uh, the, the mammal network, what the teams did was they developed a very detailed georeferencing protocol. And so it has very full documentation of how you derive each of these measures, why you derive them. You know, essentially it's a full documentation. It adds like 20 fields to your database, but it's really nice data. Yeah. And so Manus kind of debuted that, and they also debuted the concept of um, pooling the georeferencing, the, the, the locality data. And then instead of like, you know, I'm the curator at the University of Kansas, so you know, my colleagues and I will, will add the georeferences to our data. Rather, what we should do is add the georeferences to all of the data from Kansas or from the central US. And somebody who's in California should georeference the California data, including the California data that are ba based at the University of Kansas. Okay, so essentially you had area experts. Um, later on, we essentially made, in, in the HerpNet and Ornus proposals, we made that process much more fluid so that, you know, essentially people could reach into a pool of localities and pull out and then push back uh, the georeferenced localities. It was really neat. And now VertNet has this massive pool, it's hundreds of thousands of localities that have been georeferenced under the same protocols. And so Sandby's had a training with John just a few months ago, 